Oh, thank you. You can hear me? Oh. So anyway, we were in downtown San Francisco, and then, no, okay, no, um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Let's let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to these people. Um, Because these are friends of Pastor Miracle, um, I already feel the sense of closeness, and and also responsibility, Lord. I ask that you give me the right words to say. I ask that your your Holy Spirit um, speak through me and speak to the hearts of everyone here, and that your love would be shown to them. And uh, Lord, I pray these things in your name. Amen. So, point number one, um, the pursuit to love God, God's way. To love God, God's way. I, I think immediately of, the, of Cain and Abel and the two sacrifices that were offered. And I believe both sacrifices were offered from the heart. But there's a difference between doing something God's way and doing something our way but for God. Now remember in Judges, it says over and over again, when they go through that cycle of disobedience, it says, then every man did that which was wrong in his own eyes, Right? Every man did that which was wrong in his own eyes. Is that what it says? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. See, the problem was not that they thought they were doing wrong. The problem was that they thought they were doing right. But it was in their own eyes. We need to make sure we're loving God God's way. So, A, it requires a proper knowledge of God. See, it says, the Lord our God is one Lord. Secondly, it requires a proper fear of God. Now, this is easy to miss, but it says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. It is a command. Now, it's interesting because it's sort of semantics. We say, well, God doesn't command you to love love him. He kind of leaves it up to you. God commands you to love him. He doesn't force you to love him. He doesn't force you to obey him. But it is a command. We are commanded to love God. So in order order to have a proper love for God, first there has to be that fear of God, which cares about obeying him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. See, it requires giving all. Now, I don't know about you, but all thine heart, all thy soul, all thy might is a pretty high order. That's a pretty high order. I don't, I don't think there's anybody here that can raise their hand and say, oh, yeah, I've done that. You know, 100% of all of me, I am perfect. I have given God all my heart, all my soul, all my might. Um, and when Jesus quotes this passage um, in the New Testament, he, he says, all thy mind. It is easy to read the word all without fully grasping its weight. God is asking for 100%. Not just 100% of one aspect of my being, such as my soul, but also of my body, Strength, my thoughts, mind, and passions, my heart. God wants it all. Remember that passage, I believe it's Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's easy to miss the fact that it says bodies, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, okay, I've given God my life. Interesting. In that passage, he asks for your body, what you do with your hands, what you do with your feet, what you do with your eyes. It's this temple is going to be a sacred temple for the Lord to live in. I'm going to give him this temple. It will be sanctified and a holy place for God. D, it is linked to keeping his commandments. 
These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Deuteronomy 11, 1 says, God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments alway. So a broader look at scripture. Godly love for our creator is more than a gushy fleeting emotion that ebbs and flows, comes and goes, and is subject to the whims of our deceitful hearts. When studying all mentions of love from Genesis to Revelation, there is a common theme. Our love for God is demonstrated by keeping his commandments. You're familiar with the idea of a, of a love language. Years ago, I read that, that interesting book, I think Gary Chapman or something, the, the Five Love Languages. Well, I think scripture shows that there, there is a love language for God, and that, and that love language is obedience. In Joshua 22.5, this is Old Testament, it says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. In the New Testament, John 14, 15 to 31, it says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he, he it is that loveth me. For he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. See, the ultimate test of your love for God, the ultimate test, is not your passion. It's not how loudly you can say it, or how many tears you can shed as you say it, or how long you spend on your face saying it. The ultimate test of your love for God how much you care about what he has told you he wants you to do. See, there's a, there's a story um, about a man who told his son, he said, son, I want you to go clean your room. And his, his son says, oh, okay, I'll go clean my room. And his room is just a mess. And he walks in there, and he's just overwhelmed. And he says, man, I, I don't feel like cleaning my room. So, well, a few hours go by. And he goes up to his dad. He says, Dad, I got a surprise for you. And his dad says, what, you cleaned your room? He says, no, I did something even better than that. And what's that? He says, come with me. And he walks into his closet, and he shows him a shiny pair of black shoes. He says, Dad, I shined your shoes. Dad looks down at him. He says, what about your room? He says, no, this is even better than that, right? He says, son, I'm happy to have shined shoes, but I asked you to clean your room. You see, sometimes when we're, when we're not doing something the way God asks us to do it, it's an exaltation of self. Well, I didn't want to clean my room, so I put what Dad said to do second place. My desire became first place. His desire became second. And then I justified it by saying, I did a greater deed. But it wasn't what he asked. It wasn't what, wasn't what he had asked of me. Next. John, 1 John 2, 3, and 4. And hereby we do know that we love him, that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Remember in Matthew 7, where, all, where the men come to him and they say, uh, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. You see, the problem was with those men. Their eyes were on the miracles. God, I did miracles for you. I cast out demons. I did many wonderful works, these amazing wonders for you. And, and God says, your eyes are on all of that. But you're doing iniquity. You're, you're in deep sin. You see, your heart was never cleansed. You never truly came to me, and I never knew you. You can have the greatest spiritual facade the world has ever seen and still not know him. Because what God's looking for is that heart that has repented. That heart of obedience. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Probably the greatest well, one of the greatest passages in the New Testament that's relevant to now is 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is a prophecy 
about what the world will look at look like at the end, right before um, the time of the rapture and the and the end of the world. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's talking about partially the state of the church and the state of the world, but one of the things it says there is speaking lies in hypocrisy. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. God, I love you so much. There's no obedience. There's no heart to keep his commandments. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Next page. Now, I, uh, I didn't write in all the, uh, all the blanks on my copy. I don't have a good master copy, so I'm doing some of these blanks from memory. So hopefully I'll, I will remember them all, and they won't get towed away by the little tow car in my brain. The soul is our mind, emotion, and will. This, am I on the right? I, I, there we go. I'm on the wrong page. Okay. 2 John 1, 5 and 6. And now I beseech thee, lady, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Revelation chapter 2. You see, this is broad. This is the whole scope of scripture. Revelation 2, 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. See, left thy first love is a call to repentance because they are no longer obeying the word of the Lord. Obedience is God's love language. Now, I would challenge you, if you, if you looked throughout Scripture and looked up every time it talks about how to love God, you will find a connection to obedience every time. Um, that was, it was a lot of references to look up, but I found that to be a connecting thread through all of it. It was always tied to obeying the Lord. E, it meant keeping his commandments near them constantly. In thine heart, teach them, talk of them. When thou sittest in thine house, liest down, risest up. God instructed Israel in how to be surrounded by his commandments. He has similarly given us ways to keep his word in our hearts and to be filled with his spirit. Singing in our hearts is one of these ways. This is not merely about a song on our lips or scripture in our minds, but these passages speak of a rich indwelling of the living word, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and the declaration of truth that emanates from the heart, both in the presence of God and before others. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's interesting because these are the two passages in the New Testament where instruction is given on what we should sing. People, people will say, and, and rightly so, that specific musical styles aren't really mentioned in the Bible. You know, you're not going to find the word rock and roll in the Bible. You're not going to find jazz in the Bible. You're not going to find, um, you know, similar other things. But I th I, I've gotten the sense in a lot of the passages that I've looked at that the Bible says quite a bit more about styles than we think it does. But here we have three specific ones pointed out to us, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Important thought. As a musician, I am held responsible for many things. I have a responsibility to ensure that when I am ministering, the word of Christ is being communicated in all wisdom. You see, it is possible to communicate the word of Christ in a way that's foolish, in a way that misrepresents the Lord or misrepresents the truth. I want to make sure that it is communicated in wisdom. I have a responsibility to seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit as the source of my song. I have a responsibility to be mindful of what I am teaching and admonishing people to. And I first and foremost have a responsibility to seek to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. For only when this is my pursuit can my music be said to be truly Christ-honoring. Admonishing. Admonishing. That's an interesting word. It means to reprove someone. I mean, who would think that, that playing a piece of music you would be instructed to use music in a way. I mean, this is what it means to reprove. Hey, you need to get right. 
I mean, sometimes maybe a little bit more gracious than that, but something's not right here. We need, how, about, how about we correct that? How about, how about we get right here? To reprove through music, to admonish someone through music. How much correction and admonishment and, and reproof is happening in our hearts when we sing those hymns and we think about those words and they minister to us and they say, hey, we need to get right here. There's some amazing words in the hymns we sing if we apply our minds. It, um, F, it requires exclusion. Now, this is interesting. The love, of God, the love that God wants from us requires exclusion. See, it's not possible to love one thing without hating its opposite. You know, I can't really love my family without hating when they're in danger. I can't really love my child without hating when they get step into traffic. Now, I don't have a child, but I love them anyway. No. <laughs> um, you see, to love someone or to love something requires exclusion. I couldn't imagine being married to somebody and saying to my wife, I love you, but I also love all the other women in the world probably just as much. I think she'd have a problem with that. I'm pretty sure the expectation is she wants exclusion. She doesn't want me showering my love on all the women. She wants it exclusive to her. And I'm not married either, by the way. Who else isn't married in here? Uh, between the eight, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> all right. Um, love is not merely a feeling. It is the choosing of one thing or person over another. It is exclusive. Exodus 20. I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And that's an interesting thing because we see the nature of God's love and God's hate. You see, his, his hate in this passage, which this is, there's a context here with the whole cursing of generations. There's a context here that's important. But it lasted to the third and fourth generation. But did you see them that love his commandments? To the thousands. And I just think, we think about how horrible hell is. I can't imagine how wonderful heaven's going to be. That's the nature of God. His love is, is amazing. Okay, a musical perspective. As mentioned before, the love God wants is 100% exclusive. Just like Israel was in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament is susceptible to idolatry. Though it typically presents itself in different, more subtle ways. We usually find it masquerading as false doctrine, like the prosperity gospel, the New Age movement, veneration of saints, word of faith, etc., and carnal living. God desires for us to worship him and him only his way. As a musician, that means I must take special care to not allow carnal worldly influences into my heart. If I do, it will find its way into my music. Question, how much of the world has entered our music? How about the music we use to worship God? We should not look to Egypt or Babylon to find out how to worship God. E-G-Y-P-T-B-A-B-Y-L-O-N. <laughs> this is why we must reject the ideologies of the contemporary Christian music movement. Some thoughts here. First, uh, mysticism. This is the idea of seeking a meaningful encounter with God on my terms rather than God's. Unless the worship experience is meaningful to me, then it's not valid. See, it doesn't matter how God instructed me to worship him. Unless it's meaningful to me, it's not valid. Mysticism. Syncretism. Blending with other religions or belief systems, such as Eastern healing techniques, meditation, yoga, um, Christian rock, Catholicism, etc. See, rock, rock is a form of worldliness, paganism. And when we put Christian on it, we're blending. Syncretism. Ecumenism, watering down the truth to reach a worldly audience. When our main fear becomes not being offensive to the world, we've now put, 
We've now given the world permission to decide what we can say and what we can't say. Watering down the truth to reach a worldly audience. Anytime we compromise the holiness of God, uh, compromise on the holiness of God, whether in music, worship practices, outreach, etc., we cease to love him the way he wants to be loved. Psalm 96, verse 9 says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. 1 Chronicles 16, 29 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Two, the pursuit to love God with all my heart. So first, we had the pursuit to love God, God's way. Now we have the pursuit to love God with all my heart. Music is the language of emotions. And the heart is the seat of my emotions and desires. Music really, I mean, I, I play lots of classical music. and I love music. But one of the keys, I think, to really making music soar is making it a pure expression of feeling and pure expression of emotion. I mean, you, you think about w what music even is. It's related to this idea of, um, like, when we speak, we use... Um, Oh, what's, what's the word? Uh, rising and falling, like intonation or, um, sorry? Inflection. That's it. We, we use inflection. Thank you. See, my brain is still a little fuzzy here. But inflection and music is, is this kind of heightened form of inflection. You see, if I were to tell, well, I don't know if I should do this. I thought about this earlier today, and I don't know if I should. If I say, I, I love you, Alan. No. <laughs> I'm not going to use that as an analogy because that, I love you, Alan, and I love you, Alan. No. <laughs> um, all of a sudden, we have a different message. Same words, different message. Or um, I'll, I'll stop there. But you get the idea. You see, sometimes you'll hear, well, only the words really matter. As if the music didn't carry a message. I, I was talking to Pastor Miracle about this. Felix Mendelssohn is probably the greatest genius of music. Um, the, a, a greater prodigy than Mozart is Felix Mendelssohn. And a lot of people don't, don't really know that because, I mean, Mozart's the ideal prodigy. But Felix Mendelssohn, by historians, is considered an even greater prodigy than Mozart. And Felix Mendelssohn wrote that, uh, you know, he said, uh, people will say, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, people will say that the words have the most explicit message in music, but they say they have it backwards. Music is far more explicit than words. Far more explicit than words. No, the, the idea of, his, of what he was saying was nothing could be more explicit than the musical sounds that are being created. If, if Beethoven didn't believe that his sonatas carried some type of expression, he's just, like it says in 1 Corinthians 14, speaking into the air. You know, if the trumpet carry an uncertain sound, who shall go forth to battle? Like, it's possible to have a certain sound and an uncertain sound, and these composers knew there's expression in the music. There's a message being conveyed, and a very powerful one. So, we need, we need to think about that. Music's the language of emotion. So, when we have the emotions in order, we get passionate and exciting worship. Passionate and exciting worship. Like it says in Psalm 95, 1 and 2. Oh, expressive. That's what I need to say. Passionate and expressive. You see, I didn't get the, uh, the blanks filled in exactly on my mask. I, expressive, I think, is a better word. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Out of order. Let me see if I can get this one exactly. Deceit, confusion, and... What is my E word here? Let me see if I can. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Deceit, confusion, and the E word has left my, it got towed away in downtown San Francisco. <laughs> Boy, I wish I could remember what that E word was. Maybe it'll come to me. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 15 says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I really wish right now that that E word would come to me. Oh, well, see, God only called me to preach one year ago, and you're learning new things all the time. I need to work on my master copy here. <laughs> Emotionally dead music is not biblical music. Three, the pursuit to love God with all my soul. All my soul. The soul is our mind, emotion, and will. Specifically, it is the core of our being, our identity and personality. It is immaterial and distinct from the body. When we get this in order, we have selfless identification with Christ, submission of my will. When my soul is in proper order, my identification is with Christ, and I submit to him. When it's out of order, we get self-edification, pride, and mysticism. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. The idea being, when I say something that nobody can understand, that doesn't help anyone. You see, that only, that's all about me. That's all about how I get to feel something. But what God wants is prophesying. God wants it to minister to the people of the church. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. When thou art come into the land, not long, learn to do after the abomination of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a... There is another word. You know, I can actually look this one up. Or someone may even have that word memorized. But I'm thinking it's conjurer, but it, I don't think that's right. Deuteronomy 18... 9 through 12, and I apologize. That's something that I should have had um, ahead of time. What was that? Consulter. And who was that? Uh, 500 points for my sister Alyssa Cannon. She's, uh, she's leading the score right now. Okay. <laughs> Consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Next, the pursuit to love God with all my mind, with all my mind. The Bible word for this is sober. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Important thought. Think of all the aberrations we become susceptible to when we disengage our mind. Mass hypnosis, counterfeit revival, false conversion, false doctrine, evil spirits, Counterfeit miracles, false Christs, etc. You see, there is a whole Christian movement right now built around the idea of disengaging our mind. When we enter the building, the idea is you shut your mind off and you just take in the experience, whatever it may be. And I believe that Satan uses that as a vehicle through which he passes false doctrine he creates false converts, and he manufactures a false worship experience. Be careful about the idea of disengaging your mind. And uh, yes, hypnosis is real. <laughs> For those who haven't, um, haven't seen that before, it's an interesting thing. But it is possible even to have what's called mass hypnosis, where an entire crowd is very subtly under the... Uh, Control, in a way, of whoever's speaking. Similar to the idea if I said everyone stand, everyone would stand. Like, that, 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 can, that can very easily happen. And what trickles in is, very often, false doctrine. So all my mind. In, when this is in order, we get sound doctrine, sobriety, teaching, learning, and submission of my thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When this is out of order, we get pride and intellectualism. Pride and intellectualism. 
1 Corinthians 8.1 says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. The, the goal is not to impress people with, with intellectualism and make everything about the mind and, you see, my perfect doctrine here where I've got everything figured out and I don't care about showing anybody, you know, love or understanding that we are all imperfect and we're all making steps towards God and charity is essential. It's more important than any gift we have is charity. Charity is essential. It's the vehicle through which God wants us to be running our church through the New Testament, uh, through this age, is charity. God wants charity. When we make everything about what I know, what my knowledge is, intellectualism and pride, there's a lack of charity that comes from that. So we need to keep, keep that in order. Five, the pursuit of loving God with all my strength. With all my strength. Psalm 33, 3. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Play skillfully with a loud noise. In order. When this is in order, we get skillful musicianship. Well prepared special music. And a strong approach. In the Bible, male musicians are masculine. Male musicians are masculine. Now, I know how it is. When you see the graduates walk at the Bible college, they're all wearing pink. All the music, all the music majors, I should say. All the music majors are all wearing pink. We know how it is. We know the stereotype. Music is an emotional, is an emotional thing. Something that I, that I try to work on, and this can get out of order in my life as well, but I, I, I go to the gym and I lift weights, and I, uh, I like to go camping. I like to go outdoors. I like to try to engage in things that keep that masculine side running because music does have a very strong emotional pull to it. But you see throughout scripture, male musicians are masculine. Ecclesiastes 9, and 10, 9 verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. First Chronicles 9.33. And these are the singers, chief of the fathers and Levites, who remaining in the chambers were free, for they were employed in that work day and night. When this is out of order, we get showmanship, vanity, and... Oh, man. I am kicking myself. Carnality. Carnality. Showmanship. Vanity and carnality. Now, I'm going to... How many of you are familiar with the name Liberace? Pianist. A lot of people. Now, sometimes I enjoy... Sometimes I enjoy listening every once in a while to what he does. But if we're not careful, the Liberace approach can start to get into, get into our hearts. And this, this is true whether it's hymn music or whether it's other things. I need to make sure that when I'm playing... I'll pick a song like Amazing Grace. all of a sudden becomes amazing piano whatever when you know what what happens to you know we're supposed to play skillfully there's nothing wrong with playing skillfully it's actually what we're commanded to do God wants us to to play with all of our might and to play skillfully but when the message of the music changes from how great the grace of God is to how fast the notes can move very quickly, it can start to become about the musician and not about the, not about the Lord. And that's something that I have to think about when, when, I, when I play. Is I, w I want to make sure that the message of the music does not get lost in the technique of the message. So that, that idea of, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't turn worship to God into a performance and even 
just in our other music in general, should not be about us, but glorifying everything can be done to the glory of, to the glory of God. Okay, so where are we here? Yes, carnality. Second, uh, First Timothy 4, 8. For the bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Romans 8, 5 through 8. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are after the flesh cannot please God. They that are after the flesh cannot please God. So now I get into a part of the message that uh, is a little bit more practical, but this is also where things can very easily hit home. I know it hits home for me, and I constantly have to work on this because I don't think, you know, we won't reach the perfection of heaven and glory until we're glorified with Christ in eternity. So I think we all kind of have to think about I probably need to shore up my music, just like with entertainment of all kinds, movies of all kinds, books of all kinds. It's so easy for stuff to creep in. But the moment of danger happens when we no longer try. When we no longer try and we give up and we say it's just not worth it anymore, that's the moment of danger. I think we always need to be at a place where we can shut the movie off, where we can turn the radio off, and when we can shut the book, well, if I get to a place in my heart where I'm three quarters of the way through a book, something comes up, and the theme of the book just reaches a point where I'm like, this is headed in a bad place. This is taking my mind where it shouldn't be. But I really want to know what happens. I think we should never leave that point in our, in our lives where we can't close that book, say, Done. Or turn that movie off and say, that, that's not pleasing to the Lord. Turn it off. It's a scary place when we can't, when we can't turn and repent. So here's just a note regarding musical styles. Rhythm. Oh, boy. R-H-Y-T-H-M. That's, that's a difficult spelling word there. R-H-Y-T-H-M is the element in music that makes us want to move. Some movements are appropriate and edifying. Marching, clapping, stuff like that's talked about in scripture, fine. Some movements are sensual and even sexual in nature, swinging shoulders, thrusting hips, etc. Now, I'm appealing a little bit to common sense. The way that somebody moves with their dancing a waltz doesn't take much common sense to see that's not the same way someone dances in a nightclub or in the center of a stage in a, play, in a, in a bar. You're going to see a different type of dancing there. And there's a purpose to that. The, and the word for that in the Bible is lasciviousness, the idea of trying to entice the lust of others. So, edify, um, and some movements, while not unacceptable of themselves, are not edifying and orderly, such as running around the church, waving your arms around, etc., some simply just have bad associations. So rock music in particular exalts the body at the expense of the soul and mind. So the rhythm of rock music is a sensual rhythm. It goes by several names, the rock beat, the back beat, the anapestic beat, etc. While it's not the purpose of this lesson, learning to identify and discern, while it's not the purpose of this lesson, learning to identify and discern the rock beat may be the most helpful to, tool we have in avoiding music which dishonors God. Now, I can't imagine that there are a lot of people here who remember what America was like in the 40s or the 30s. Oh, we have one for the 40s. My dad was born in 1946. His favorite television shows are probably Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy. He loves watching, watching those old films. But you know what you, what you don't see in those is a rock beat. And the world was a lot different back then. And I know that that can be due to a lot of things. Um, correlation isn't always causation. But we can see America was quite a different world back then. So what we have now 
is a world where everything has sort of been inundated and soaked with something called the rock beat. And this has been the case even before the 30s and 40s. It was around in the 1910s, 20s, and even before that in some, in some circles. But it started getting blended with popular music more and more in the 40s and 50s and 60s until it just totally took over. And you couldn't find any genre of music that wasn't filled with this thing called the rock beat. Now, I'm not trying to create some kind of boogeyman monster here, <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to talk about what this is. Because I, I, I don't just mean to, like, to, to scare you, but we're going to identify it and talk about it for a minute. So while the rock beat is not the only way music can dishonor God, not even close, I do believe that it is Satan's primary form of attack in modern day music. Satan is a musical instrument with tabrets, which is percussion, and pipes. Don't you suppose he would know how to use it as a weapon against God? There was a term going around back then called the devil's music. And, and that was partially because America was a little bit more biblically literate back then. And they knew in Ezekiel, it talks about the tabrets and pipes of Lucifer or of, of, of the devil that he had. And in that passage, he's called the king of Tyre. He had tabrets and pipes. And it's interesting that if you look at, um, you look at uh, music that is used to uh, invoke spirits, there's two main types of instruments that are used. Wind instruments and drums. And, and I'm not saying you stop playing the flute. <laughs> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a drum. But I find it interesting, huh? Wind instruments and drums are what's most often used, and, and like wind instruments, even like, like, uh, like bells or pipes, are, are often what's used to invoke spirits, and those are the two instruments that Satan has in his body. But don't you think he would know how to use music as a weapon against God? Now, I'm going to share with you a quote from one of my favorite musical people in the world. This is a man named David Duball. He teaches uh, piano history at the school of Ju at Juilliard School, which is the most basically most prestigious music school in the world. And I love listening to his insights. I have a book like this thick by him where he rates all the pianists and he talks about their performances. But sometimes he'll, he'll just wax eloquent on something. And this is him talking about rock music. He says, today there is no chance to find wisdom because the young have been lobotomized forever with the most horrid propaganda of all time, rock and roll. It soaks the brain and sucks out the life of a child they may grow old, but they don't achieve wisdom. Their brains are burnt out and their ears are deaf. And believe me, I'm not being too harsh. David Duball, um, professor at Juilliard School. Some descriptive quotes about rock from those who produce it. How many of you know who uh, Gene Simmons is? Like CNN or the rock group KISS? He, he's a guy, he wears the white makeup and he has like a black lightning bolt near his eyes or whatever. At least I think I'm getting it right. I'm not too familiar with, but Gene Simmons says, and I'm, I'm using this, I know Pastor Miracle isn't here, but I'm trusting that this is okay. Some of this stuff gets just slightly, um, well, what's the word? It's just descriptive, and, I, and my desire is to be appropriate here, but it says, he said, that's what rock is all about. Sex with a 100 ton megaton bomb, 100 megaton bomb, the beat. Frank Zappa said, rock music is sex. The big beat matches the body's rhythms. And this is part of the reason why Elvis was not allowed to be shown on television, because at the time, people knew what his body language was signaling to people when they saw how he moved. The beat matches the body's rhythms. Steven Tyler of Aerosmith, rock and roll is synonymous with sex. And you can't take that away from it. It just doesn't work. Steven Tyler. He also said, rock music is the strongest drug in the world. John Lennon, he was famous for being part of the Beatles and uh, wrote a lot of very popular songs. He said, rock music has got the same message as before. It is anti-religious, anti-nationalistic, and anti-morality. But now I understand what you have to do. You have to put the message across with a little honey on spoken not long before his death in 1980. And I believe that's what Satan has done. Because you see, Satan's okay with losing the battle if he can win the war. See, he has laced the rock beat with a whole bunch of honey 
all these words about, oh, I love God, or words that sound like they are okay. They're perfectly good words. And he spread it all over this rock beat and covered it with honey. David Bowie said, it's musical soma, which apparently is a, an intoxicating drink. I had to look that up. Never heard of that. It's musical soma. Rock and roll will occupy and destroy you that way. It lets in lower elements and shadows that I don't think are necessary. Rock has always been the devil's music. You can't convince me that it isn't. A few extra quotes. Rock and roll is a beast. Well-intentioned people thought you could pick it up and cuddle it. They forgot it had claws of the bands. I know because I was one of them. Behind every sweet doo-wop and bebop is an unfettered sexuality and sympathy for the devil. Last page. All right. Rock music in particular has been demonstrated to be both powerful and addictive, as well as capable of producing a subtle form of hypnosis in which the subject, though not completely under trance, is still in a highly suggestive state. So we shouldn't be surprised when we find false doctrine in some of the words of these songs that are using rock music. Don't listen to the words. It's the music that has its own message. I've been stoned on the music many times, Timothy Leary. So, well, a quote is not absolute truth. They, they could be wrong. And I, when I tell you this is where all of the evidence points, it's really, it really is. You don't have to look far to find this. It does not carry the same infallible authority as Scripture, nor does the witness of history or the science of music therapy, which all cast a damning light on the influence of the rock beat. Yet to the wise and discerning Christian, I believe the weight and congruence of evidence is powerful. So I'm going to, uh, I, I, I want you to know, I want you to know what this, what this sounds like. Because if I don't, if I'm not careful here, you're going to think I'm against metronomes or something. <laughs> you know, which, by the way, Susie, I hope you're practicing with your metronome, right? I'm kidding. So, here, I'll pull, pull up the, me the metronome app here first. This is just, this is just a metronome. And this is, just a, this is just a normal beat in music. You know, when you, see the, when you see the song leader up here waving his arms, he's showing you where the beat is. There's nothing wrong with a beat, obviously. There, was, there were beats and rhythms in music, you know, since music started, basically. Now, what is the beat? What is the rock beat? Well, the rock beat is something that originated in pagan worship practices. And those pagan worship practices took place um, mainly in Africa, but there were, some, there were some other places as well that had it. And when it came to America, it never really never really, uh, see, when, how do I put this? Sometimes when you go to a country, you embrace just everything about that, about that region, about that area. But rock beat was, the rock beat was something that started just kind of getting and mixing into the music in America. And uh, in, the early, in the early 1900s, it just started getting interlaced with what would have been more of the traditional American style of music, now we started interlacing this new, interesting beat from paganism. This beat sounds like this. I mean, this is the beginning of a very famous song by a band called Queen, called We Will Rock You. And I did get permission from Pastor Miracle to do this, because I'm very careful in a church. I don't want to do anything that would not please the, the pastor. So... You hear that? If I had everybody in here do that, boom, boom. We would all start feeling the groove, right? <laughs> the other day, when I was in San Francisco, there was this place. I thought that the walls were going to cave in. It was just da boom, da boom, da boom. It was like the loudest thing I'd ever witnessed in my life. I was like three blocks down the road, and I hear this just massive booming coming. And so I run up to it, and 
<laughs> I know, and there's all these people standing outside, and I'm like, what is going on here? I thought the walls were going to cave in. I mean, I was expecting you would see people walking in, you know, normal, and walking out like, you know, this. Not to, not to mention when they're inside of that place, I don't know how everybody's not just, you know, moving around like that every time the, the boom happens. But that sound of boom, boom, tss, boom, boom, tss, or boom, tss, da, boom, tss, da, boom, tss, da. See, there's, there's a way that you move to that. Boom, tss, da, boom, tss, da. That you feel, that you feel the groove of it. Now, probably the easiest way to identify it is to remember that beginning of We Will Rock You. Boom, boom. And how that makes you want to move. And the feel that it gives you. Because that's really what's at the heart of it, is that groove and that feeling, and that, that kind of side-to-side -side movement that you only get when that beat is in it. Now I'm going to take, you see, you don't have to have a drum set to do this. And this has been one of the, the I think, misunderstandings um, in, in certain circles in, in the church is, well, if we just get rid of the drums, then we don't have to worry about it. It's not how it works. It's even possible for me to apply it in the piano playing. Now, if I take a song like Amazing Grace, one, two, three, one, that's the feeling of a waltz. We recognize that waltz feel. Now, first of all, I, I found that when this song is changed, first of all, they change the timing of it, so it's, it's in 4-4 four, four time. Nothing wrong with this. Now I'm going to make it a beat. practice that all the time at home. No. <laughs> no. Do you feel how the mood instantly changed? And, and what's interesting, and this is one of the things I do, rock music is a package deal. When the rhythm changes, you start getting this jazz feel that starts to feel really good in it. You start getting more breathiness in it. And you start getting more of these other things, which I don't think are at the root of it. It's possible to be, you know, breathy without being sensual. It's possible to, uh, it, it's possible to be, um, you know, jazzy in a way that I think is sometimes appropriate. Uh, you know, especially, you know, music was created for purposes. There is an appropriate setting for sensuality. That is, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, we've got Song of Solomon, which is a song. But there is, um, I think, when we add the rock beat to it, it opens this door that seems to let everything in. See, remember when, when uh, Saul had his evil spirit and he asked David to come, they asked David to come and play for him. What drove the evil spirit out? David playing a musical instrument. Now, there's no recording of David using any words that we know of. Oh, evil spirit, come out of Saul. You know, I ask you to come out of him in the name of, you know, there, there's no witness of there being words. It's simply a harp. And piano, you know, is like a sideways harp, but... It's just musical instrument, and yet that spirit was communicated to and told to leave. I believe the witness of history tells us with overwhelming evidence that just as much as we can use that music to tell the evil spirit to leave, music can be used to tell the evil spirit to come, to welcome them. And when we use something that is experimental, that, that historically existed in the pagan worship practices and only entered into America about 100 years ago and then started taking over the music. And now when we listen to country, it's no longer, do your ears hang low, do the wobble too. It's like, no, it's, I got my girlfriend in, whatever. Like, how did it go from do your ears hang low to the back seat of the truck? You know, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> And I mean to be appropriate there, I, I, but it's what happens when you let it in. They add that, that thing to it, 
And we have the witness of history that tells us, I don't think this is a good idea. Okay. So, the rock beat is a package deal. You will find it accompanied by varying degrees of breathy vocals, jazz styling, self-glorifying performance, repetitiveness, profane lyrics, inappropriate subject matter, the list goes on. It corrupts everything it touches. See, I don't think that the words are necessarily the substance of what makes the music wrong. I think the words are a reflection of what's already being communicated in the music. There's a reason why today's modern music, I don't, I don't want you to look, look up the words of some of these popular songs right now that all the kids in school are listening to that have more profanity than just about any film you could watch in about two minutes. You see, you couldn't put those words to the, the tune of Do Your Ears Hang Low, you know. There's a reason why those words match the music, because that music is sending that same message, but it's sending it in a way, I think the word for this is superliminal. You don't really notice it. Not subliminal, but superliminal. So, Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. See, rock music has this corrupting effect. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The rock beat is now present in the vast majority of modern popular music. Country, reggae, R&B, jazz, folk, hip-hop, funk, heavy metal, pop, and Christian music. I... See, I I don't have a lot of confidence when I go to the store and they have a section labeled Christian. You see, this this beat has gotten into everything. when When you look at the Christian section on Spotify... You haven't narrowed the bridge enough. You see, even in Matthew 7, when, when, God, when Jesus is talking about the narrow path and the broad path, I think the idea is that both paths, people are under the impression that they are headed to heaven. Because the whole context is false teaching. Depart from me, I never knew you. He's talking about enter in. When, if you're trying to get into heaven, don't go that broad path. You're going to think it's the right way. You're going to see the whole crowd doing it. They think they're headed to God. That narrow path where you don't have the corruption of the false teaching, he says, is the way that leads to everlasting life. Look for the narrow path. Even in Christianity, look for the narrow path. I would, you know, I would advise you, you know, if you're looking for good, truly Christian, I see the, the quotes are on there. Without the quotes, music, you know, I might ask Pastor Miracle about that. You know, what, what music do you listen to that, you know, is uncorrupted by this? I want to hear some good Christian music that reflects biblical values and seeks to not be uh, corrupted by worldliness. Because I know there's, there's lots of good, great music out there. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to find, but there is a lot of it out there if you, if you want to look and, you, and if you know what to look for. Conclusion. Well, good rule of thumb. Does the music make you want to move up and down or side to side? So, conclusion. As we have seen, loving God his way requires having things in proper agreement. We should not be engaging the emotions without engaging the mind. We should not be engaging our strength without also engaging the heart, etc. God wants all four components working together in synergy. I'm going to do one more musical example here. I'm going to take a piece of classical music. And I'm going to try playing it in different in different ways. Let's say I'm just purely the intellectual experience of it. You should like this. It's classical. If you fall asleep, then you have no culture. <laughs> You know, and then 40 minutes later, you're like, please, stop, <laughs> stop insulting me. I'm not intelligent. I don't get it, <laughs> you know. And so, okay, so, okay, let, now let's, let's imagine that I just engage the harp without engaging anything else.
What if I just engage my strength without anything else? <laughs> And Beethoven's rolling over in his grave, you know. Stop. <laughs> okay. And what's, what's the last one? My soul. Oh, this is all about me. Now I'm going to play the great Beethoven Appassionata Sonata. And I want you all to stop thinking about anything else and just meditate on how wonderful my performance is going to be. See. It's easy to get out of order, and there's no such thing as, as perfect here. You know, that, that this ideal where we're engaging our mind properly, we're engaging our skill properly, we're submitted to the Lord, we're, you know, where we've got all the things in proper order is, is the ideal. I don't think there's any of us that could say, we've got our whole life straightened out. I'm not overemphasizing any part of this. No, you see, this is a journey that I think we're all on. We're all trying to figure out, and God wants 100% of all of it, 100% of all of it. So let me think about this. Skill is okay. Emotion is okay. The mind is okay. I'm going Trying to get it just right. I don't want people to just focus on me. And I don't want people just thinking about the technique. I want all of them to work together to point people to the truth that the piece is trying to convey. Because even Beethoven was aware of some type of truth that he's wanting to convey in the music, that he's wanting to get across where the message gets entirely lost when things get out of order, when things get out of place. And the ultimate message that we want to convey in our lives is to glorify God in all that we do. We want people to look at our lives and to not see us, not see our skill or our, our, our mind, but to see God glorified through us. And they see us and they go, God is using that person in a way that glorifies and draws people to him. So additionally, God wants 100% of ourselves. This means we all have room to grow whether as musicians, employees, soul winners, family members, teachers, etc. Does God want you to learn a musical instrument? Does he want you to participate more in church music or to practice more? If you ever feel self-conscious about your singing, just think about, just think that God himself worship, God himself sings, sorry, that God doesn't worship over you, that'd be really bad. Just think that God himself sings over you. Zephaniah 3.17 says, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Now, as we get into the, uh, the altar call here, I'm going to ask uh, Alan, could you come forward for one final illustration? Because I think this, this kind of helps us to put teeth in the idea of how important this thing of music is. So you, Alan, you like to listen to, you like to listen to some edgy music. Kind of different than, 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 you know, what I'm going to represent somebody else who, I'm going to listen to the music that Pastor Miracle recommended. I'm pointed this way, and Alan is pointed that way. Right now, we both go to the same church. Alan's dressed the same way. The only difference is he's way better looking. <laughs> I'm his brother-in-law. That was a compliment. No. <laughs> We're both, you know, from all outside appearances, we look the same. But he, you know, his idea of God is that God looks like that. And my idea is that God looks like that because of the music we listen to. You see, music sets a culture in your life. You get an impression. You, you believe this is what is true. You feel it. Music is a powerful, what I would call, cultural engine. It's an engine of your culture. So... I take a step towards God, and you, Alan, could you step forward? Hi, Alan. Good to see you today. You're looking a little bit further away than you used to be. But, you know, we're still dressed the same. We still go to the same church. All right. Take another step towards God. Making pro 
progress in our life. Oh, I see you're going to a different church, Alan. But you're, you're just kind of right there, you know. And I still see you all the time, you know. But you're a little distant. It's kind of hard to, sh- to shake hands. All right, take another step towards God. Oh, you changed direction slightly. But you get the idea? His idea of God's over there. My idea is God's over there. We started in the same place. The difference was we're listening to different music. Creating a different culture in our heart of what, of how God is, of how God operates and what good is. You can go ahead and sit down. I want you thinking about the importance, not of what music is doing to you today, but of where music will take you in five years, 10 years, 15 years. Just uh, something, to, something to think about. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I know sometimes with a topic like this, you want to spend it talking about how wonderful great music is. And I think there's a message for that. And I know today was more of a message on beware and uh, more of a negative type more of a negative type message, but I pray that this is a blessing to you and will help you. So, um, everyone, you can bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to have uh, an invitation.